What it is, everyone. Thanks for joining me tonight with my guest, Michael Whalen, who appeared on this show last Saturday afternoon and told a story that by now a lot of you are familiar with about Voodoo Donuts in Portland. Um, Michael had a story just to refresh people who are joining this new. Uh, he was a musician working in Portland or hanging out with the musician crowd in Portland. Ended up being in the same circles with the owners of Voodoo Donuts, uh, notably Trace Shannon, but then his, his partner Pogson, um, Cat Daddy, um, and witnessed what appeared to be uh, child abuse going on at those locations and claims that people t close to Voodoo Donuts, close to those men, uh, told him directly that they were involved in child trafficking. So we are going to expand on that story today by asking a few more questions. Uh, the last time, so anyway, let's just get started. And thanks everyone for joining us who's watching the live show. The last we saw each other, Michael, uh, you were in a bit of trouble, right? You were, uh, the one thing we can say for sure is our interview is on the 4th and your eviction notice or your notice to vacate was for the 6th. So without revealing anything that would endanger your safety or anything, what has the last week been like? Oh, am I on? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a, a whirlwind, essentially. I mean, I'm really taken back by the amount of, of uh, supportive people there are out there. Um, they Let's see. Okay. All right, I think I'm back. I think I'm back. I had a really unusual um, technical problem. You can see my computer's using a lot of energy. It just loaded up. Very strange thing happened. My computer shut down right in, right in the middle of. Um, right in the middle of our guest saying something. So anyway, we're 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 back. We were running a lot of stuff, so we're not going to assume any conspiracy theories. Um, I'm going to get Michael back on the line. Fortunately, we started up. Pretty quickly, you can see my lips are running a little more slowly than I'm talking. And that's just a result of uh, running Skype, running this streaming software. We're going to get um, Michael back on the phone. Let me just get this set the right way. We're going to get Michael back on the phone. Uh, we actually came back pretty fast, considering we just had a total power failure in my my computer. Okay. Hey, man. Hey. Well, I don't know what happened. No, Can my my computer completely crashed. The whole thing. Oh. <laughs> Never seen anything like it. It just shut down while, in the middle of it. So anyway, you were talking about the support you were getting. You were talking about. Um, what's, what happened in this last week? Are we back on? Yeah, we're good. We're on. Okay, cool. Yeah. I, uh, I don't know where I left off, so I'll just kind of summarize. Yeah, it's been, it's been a whirlwind. Everything's been crazy, but I'm in a better place. So, um, we were able to get me out of there and I'm in a safe place to be able to try and, um, continue doing the work and getting this information out. And, um, I don't know how much to get into, um, I'm, I'm trying to think what, what you're able to say. What, well, uh, let me get into this, okay? Because I think the people have to know that um, Michael doesn't want to reveal too much about um, his location and kind of what's been going on. Uh, but I know that he did receive, there were a lot of people that reached out to me to offer support. There was a real outpouring of support for Michael. And we were lucky enough, he was lucky enough to get out of the situation he was in. Um, because of the help of um, people that watch the show. So um, thank you, everyone um, who supported Michael, and, um, and, and thank God that we were able, able to you know, get you out of there. Um, what about the response? 
what about the response to this? Um, both maybe from people who are messaging you on Twitter uh, and also now from the mainstream media. And we'll all, we can also talk about the gentleman I had on my show earlier today who kind of had something to say about <clears throat> Dante's in particular and Frank Fayacci. But anyway, what has the response been like? What do you think of what the mainstream media is saying? The response that I can gauge uh, from people reaching out to me has been overwhelmingly positive for the most part. Um, you know, there's the dealing with the, the haters and the, the disinfo stuff, but that's been pretty easy to brush aside. I'm sure anyone who's keeping track with this can attest to the fact that it's been mostly superfluous, mostly, um, you know, completely innocuous claims. But, um, yeah, I, I, I've been able to try and keep up with it a little bit as far as the articles that are coming out. I, I feel like it, it might be interesting to address the fact that it's been labeled as us being part of some far right uh initiative i i would be interested if people to kind of try to fill me in on this whole QAnon deal i don't really know what's up with it <laughs> i don't i don't follow it too much um i i know that that it's been mentioned but uh it has no affiliation with me i'm not far right i uh i'm not part of any kind of organized effort. um no one that i am speaking to including nathan is part of any organized effort which is one of the reasons why i reached out to him in the first place um, it wasn't an accident that I reached out to him. I had to try and find someone that I felt was, uh, trustworthy and, um, would represent my, uh, story to the most neutral, um, trustworthy, honest way that, that could be represented without any kind of skew. And that's one of the reasons I reached out to you in the first place, um, is because I didn't want any kind of slant associated with it. I'm not surprised that they attached one, uh, but... It'd be interesting for me to try and uh, see how they might affiliate me or, I mean, y you even, but let's let's go ahead and just say me. I don't know how they would uh, affiliate me with any kind of far right anything, really. Yeah, I and I've objected to the various articles that have done that. And basically, Media Matters was the first organization to come out and do that. And then... I'm surprised that it's Media Matters, if, if anybody who knows anything about that, that organization. I mean. Right. Well, it is interesting that they're defending this uh, and trying to label us a particular way as far right. And I also am not a follower of QAnon for people seeing me for the first time. I've been debunking QAnon since last, you know, December. Uh, I never... I never bought into it. I'm not. I don't support Donald Trump. Um, I, although you know, I, I preferred he won over Hillary Clinton, but didn't vote for him. Make a lot of videos critical of him. Very far from far right, and I've commented to all these authors to to retract the fake news that either of us are affiliated in any way with QAnon, the right wing. You know, have you? Did you vote? Do you support Donald Trump? Uh, I did not vote. Okay, and d I, I've uh, kind of lost faith in the in the whole uh, two party system. I don't know if there's other people that kind of could jump on board with it, but but when you've uh, when you've been through the kind of things that I've been through, and you've seen kind of the way that authority responds to you in a very direct way in my very personal life, I'm talking about me going to authority figures and trying to get things accomplished. When you have the kind of view that I have. Um, you lose faith in that whole kind of thing. And I remember a time where that was uh, prevalent in the truth-seeking community, and I'm a little disillusioned by the fact that there's this resurgence in participating um, in the system as if it might be the solution to our problems once again, when I remember a time not too long ago when people were very disillusioned with the two-party system and we understood that it was a duality of which uh, participating in might not be of our best interest. So... I, I have no interest in the current presidency as uh, I, I'm not opposed to the fact that 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 he may or may not be uh, helping. I just I am very reticent to believe that he is the white knight savior that we all need, even though I would love it if that was the case. And so people have asked in those articles, there's been speculation about why Voodoo Donuts. And there's also an allegation that this started on 4chan. In fact, it started with you contacting me, me listening to your story, and then me uh, doing my background research, 
you know, finding you quite credible and then hosting you on my show. Before that, there were people uh, last year. Are you aware that there were people last year that were talking about Voodoo Donuts being involved with child trafficking without much evidence? I was evidence? not aware of that. And um, to anyone asking why, it's, it's people trying to assign an ulterior motive to the whole thing, which I get. I get that everybody's playing some kind of game and some PR game or whatever. But the answer is very clear to me because this is my real life and these are things that really happen to me. The answer is very simple as to why Voodoo Donuts and why Portland, Oregon, it's because my question is, why are they abusing kids? That is the whole reason that this came to be any kind of prevalence in my life. And it's the whole reason my life got torn apart and destroyed from the ground up is because that's the question I asked. And I think that's the question other people should be asking, too. Um, if if these media um, outlets are really of any kind of credibility, why don't they start with that question? Why don't they start by asking is there any credibility to this guy's claims? And then why don't they start digging there first? And then they can ask the question, why would he be saying that they are abusing kids as opposed to assigning some kind of political motive? Why don't they start with the kind of questions that a real journalist would start with? And that, and uh, I am led to another question about Pizzagate. That's one thing they're trying to bring into this, which we're going to actually expand on, I believe, today. The reason you might have said this connects to Pizzagate. Were you looking into Pizzagate before, um, you know, any of this kind of thing? And, and we'll talk about why you said this story would connect to that. But did you used to follow no, that? No, everybody who's, who can look into my past is going to find out that I was a very busy musician. Um, it, it, and and, and in, in the more recent years, I was a very busy audio engineer. Um, I looked into Pizzagate when I was trying to find out what was happening with these people that I had become aware of. And all of the all of my awareness of this has uh, has been in trying to uncover these specific things. And there have been several people that have reached out to me since this that have brought to my attention. They're, they're being like, hey, you messaged me back eight months ago, nine months ago, telling me that you had information about this. And all of a sudden they're coming back and I'm and I'm being like, yeah, this was me trying to reach out to you about this because I was trying to figure out what the hell was going on. So my interest in. Pizzagate was completely, um, completely organically uh, because of my trying to find out these people's involvement in this type of thing. And you got to understand, if if you had been through what I've been through as a kid and you saw these kind of patterns repeating themselves, the first thing you would do is try to find out what their relationship was to the the things you already understood. Now, I knew this type of thing goes on. So obviously, when I found out that it was going on within a group that I had found myself loosely affiliated with, my goal was to try and see if they related to each other, what I could find out. And it's the kind of thing that got me in, uh, in the crosshairs of these people. And, uh, and, and that relates back, for people who didn't watch the first episode, that relates back to um, what people call gang stalking. Which, in terms of reporting to the police, you know, uh, to having talked to Portland PD and followed up on some of your cases, you know, when you talk about gang stalking, the first thing a police officer says is mental illness. The first thing. And then you say, well, you know, I, I you know, you were robbed well, and I was, think I, about that. you know. Let's think about that. Like, it, it, do we know that that's the first thing they say to everybody? Or is that just the first thing that they say? like that, that they say when they're trying to cover their tracks, because, you know, there's been several documented cases of, of this kind of thing being real and being true. So it's like, I, I feel like that defense is maybe worth looking into. Um, I do understand. I, I wasn't surprised by that being uh, something that could be said, but it's, um, it's interesting to me to try and find the precedent for that. Yeah, well, and and I could just tell people I've I experienced it, and 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 you've given real life examples, and I've confirmed with the police you were you were burglarized for over thirty thousand dollars, I believe, um, among the it was other more things. Than that, that, but I think that's what they put on right. their 
And that's just one incident and losing your job, um, being stalked on the street, having somebody park outside of your house, et cetera. So um, that's 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 what he means when he when he says found himself in the situation he was in. Um, I'm just another question. You mentioned other people contacting you. I think you were saying other people who know about this, who you've been in touch with, were talking to you. Is there a chance anybody is going to come forward who has uh knowledge firsthand or very close to firsthand the way you do yeah i don't know i mean i'm just gonna go out and answer that question honestly because we haven't discussed like i don't get to prep for these things but um there's people that are pretty credible in the community like honeybee who's reached out to me saying that she uncovered um me posting certain things about uh i i want to say that she said it was 10 months ago to 11 months ago she reached out to me saying that she wanted to know the timeline of things because she found other messages that I had sent reaching out about this sort of thing to the better part of a year ago when I tried, when I uh, established that this thing started happening to me. And between me and Nathan, I have sent him other conversations between people about starting at the same about uh, around that time when I started reaching out about this. So there are several people that are reaching out to me being like, hey, so now that you've appeared and now that you're telling your story, we're finding these uh, messages you may have sent or these posts you may have made trying to figure out what was going on with you. And I would uh, I would encourage people, uh, um, as far as police reports go in Portland, what they do is they give you um, a number of which I, um, I, I have independently shared with Nathan so he could independently verify. They give you a number, a case number. It's not like... Um, like on what you might see on CSI or wherever, where you file out a paper and they hand you like a like a copy of it or whatever. That's not how it goes. Anyone who lives in Portland can attest to this, and I'd be happy for people to come forward and verify. Um, they give you a card with their badge number, and they give you a case number on the back. And I was encouraged that my records would be publicly uh, available when you search that number. Um, we're having a little bit of difficulty on that end, but that is the way that police reports work in Portland. So... There are um, people reaching out to me about the, that time, uh, about me reaching out to them and so forth. And as far as the police reports go, that, that's how that works here. Yeah. And uh, basically, I've followed up with Portland PD and n- nobody is calling me back. The one, per- I, the one person I was able to speak with wouldn't talk on the record. Um, and I can't say anything else about it. He wouldn't talk on the record. So, but, but I was able to verify the case number was a real case number and it was for that burglary, you know, uh, that we just talked about and, and I had more conversation with him. I can't reveal it, but, um, we understand your attorney is, is, uh, either in possession of, of the full one, full reports or, um, or, or has re- requested those and those will be, uh, forthcoming. So, um, I'm actually, as long as we're talking about the cops, their latest article about us is in Newsweek, and uh, this one's brand new. And it says they it. they were able to get a statement from the police, and the statement from the police read like this: Currently, the police bureau does not believe the information to be credible. Okay, <laughs> I mean. So. I don't know anyone who follows this is going to be surprised by that, but let's let's piece this through a little bit. If you're telling me that you independently verified that these case numbers are legitimate and they involve a string of things happening to a person of which a perpetrator was involved, like a robbery, like a, a dog being killed, like threats made to someone's toddler son, things like this, if all these things are chained together with a person's... Uh, account even even if let's say that they want to say i'm a crazy person and my my account of things was that i was being gang stalked and they had another explanation their response wouldn't just be that it wasn't credible their response would be oh there's a different explanation or oh there's there's you know uh, so, something else they, i i don't find any satisfaction in the claim that it's not credible i would find satisfaction in the claim that say something that proves that i'm not telling the truth Say something that proves that there is a different perpetrator to these claims that I made. Say who else could have robbed my house, killed my dog, threatened my son, you know, threatened my boss, threatened my landlord, you know, threatened me. Say who that could have been. If it wasn't if it wasn't the people I'm claiming, it has to be somebody else. Right. That's the police's job to find out. 
they could easily put any of these claims to bed if they really wanted to, or at least they could try. I mean, but saying, I don't know anything, I won't go on the record, it's not credible, I'm not satisfied with that. I wouldn't assume anybody else who's really looking into it would be satisfied with that. And I'm encouraging people to actually use their own barometer, use their own conscience, use their own investigative um, intellect to say, are you satisfied with that? Thank you, Manon. Um, it's more the claims that are being made now based on what you've said and, and what you've said. You've told that story, the same story you told uh, a week ago on this show to the police, the times that you were, were you know, allegedly the victim of these, these, I, it seems like from conversations people have had and that have been played of people talking with the police and then my conversation seems like people know about, it seems to me like people know about you when you talk to them and, and they, they might not reveal um, as much as you think they might know. I mean, that's my impression. Sure. Um, but the, these particular, this in particular, I think is just saying they don't think there's any credible evidence that there's child trafficking going on from voodoo donuts or in, in related to voodoo donuts. And, um, and I don't know if that's good enough for people, um, but that's what we're going to get into today is get into a little bit more detail about what your evidence was. Um, let's start with how you got into the scene, you know, the Portland music scene, how you ended up being in the scene that um, put you in contact with Trace Shannon, um, Cat Daddy, and uh, some of the other characters involved. Also, Frank uh, Fayachi, who we're going to be talking about today as well. How did that start? Um, I mean, it started by, I, uh, if you've ever, I don't know, there, there's going to be some people that know somebody who's in a band or something like that. You know that, the, that people will often reach out to you. People will want to be your friend, and people will often reach out to you because they're in a similar field as you or, or whatever. And there were several people that were in local bands that uh, reached out to me to be my friend. Like, when I came out here, you got to understand my, my whole position was that I was bringing my family out here, and I was just, uh, I, I was no longer anybody. I was just the dad who wanted to take care of his kid and wanted to have some friends. So, basically... Um, people reached out through various contacts. Oh, my friend knows this person. Someone you know knows this person. And before you know it, I'm going out to uh, a get-together with several people. And they say, oh, we knew your band. And, oh, we love this. And, oh, I know this person that you know. The same kind of thing that you would think, except for when you're in, like, a band that's nationwide, that internationally popular, like that type of thing. You, you you get that same statement from everybody you meet, that they, that anybody who's in the same circles, they know your work, they know your band. You don't know who to, to believe is actually a friend or who's actually just a fan or who's actually, you know, you just don't know. So you meet a bunch of people and you see who's cool and you see who's not and you try to use your best gauge of character. It's my opinion that it wasn't completely natural how all these people surrounded me. It's my opinion that there was a little bit more of a, calculated effort to surround me in the same group. I don't think that it's a coincidence that I was surrounded by this group. Um, and it was, it, it just, it spawned like that. It was like, oh, first we're going to a bar and I'm going to a bar with these four people. And then it's these 10 people. And then all of a sudden it's this party and all of a sudden it's this place. And, and you know, uh, uh, the, the reason why it elevated so quickly and it was, it was over so quickly is because as soon as I was confronted with any of this being a possibility, I drew a considerable amount of attention to myself in objecting to it. And then I was confronted by people who, what it seemed like in an intimidation effort, were explaining exactly how they do things and, um, and the things that they do in a way of, it almost seemed like flaunting it. It almost seemed like intimidation. You, 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 if you were just the layman sitting at home listening to my story, you might be like, well, why would they tell him that this is what they did? Why would they tell him that they did all these things? Wouldn't they want to hide it? And it's like, when you're confronted with these type of people, other survivors will know what I mean when I say that they flaunt this. They are proud of this. They feel protected in this, and they feel untouchable in this. And let me, uh, we're going to get to the details of what was said to you, and we're going to get close to saying who said it to you. 
Um, when did things start getting weird with this group of people? Not, not very far out from first uh, associating myself with this group. There are certain people that I still don't believe are involved that were like an intermediary that introduced me to this person or that person or this person. Because you got to understand, like this guy, let's say Frank, for instance, if we're talking about Frank, he owns several clubs where musicians play. So if I introduce myself to a musician, they may or may not be involved in any way, shape or form. But like they're going to want to introduce me to the guy who runs the club if I ever want to play music or they play at his club. It doesn't necessarily implicate them. So you can easily find yourself entangled in a um, in a social setting with these people. So um, your your question was who? What was it? Who introduced when, me? When did it get weird? Like when? Oh, did... it, yeah, it got weird super quick. It got weird the first time I was specifically brought to a party. When I found out that the party I was brought to was the owner of Voodoo Donuts, and this specific, if we're talking about this specific time, it was Trace Shannon. Um, when I found out I was brought to his house is when it specifically got weird. And that's the, the, the very first party that I keep referencing is because that's the party where I said I wanted to leave. Now, me saying I wanted to leave was enough to draw a group of people that I had never seen before to confront me and corner me to ask me and my friends who brought me there why I wanted to leave, um, why I would be leaving, uh, who who brought me here, all this type of stuff in a very intimidation-like tactic. So I'd say maybe a month after I made the acquaintance of some people that brought me around, what, it already started getting weird, uh, like right away. Okay, and what does that mean? What did you see at Trace when, Shannon's house? When I was at this party, as well as at no less than three other engagements, um, at this party, I saw what immediately uh, raised my suspicion of people telling me that there was all kinds of sexual things going on the, in the back, and I know that people were using drugs at this party, and then me personally seeing children being brought into the area that I was explicitly described as where sexual things were going on, me asking why there were kids here and why they were being brought back there, whose kids they were, and me asking these questions drew attention to me right away. So the way that this party was described to me is that what's happening out front is this, and this is where people are doing drugs, and people are doing sexual shit in the back. Then I see kids being brought into the back. Then I'm asking, who are these kids? Who are their parents? And, and that immediately drew attention onto me. So when I'm asking why there are adult males and females taking children into the back where apparently there's supposed to be sexually explicit stuff happening, of which that I can also attest to the fact that there was sexually explicit stuff going on because I, I know someone who engaged in sexual intercourse in this exact area of the party that it's supposed to be happening. When I saw that there were children being brought back into this exact area and me asking questions about it, I was immediately confronted. And um, what were you confronted with? What did what happened? I was confronted with people asking why I wanted to know who these kids were, why I wanted to leave, who brought me here, um, what uh, what problems I had with what was going on, and then after some kind of confrontation that happened with my friend, I, my, my friend Robert, of who I don't think was involved, um, he was confronted and he was able to, however. Um, allow us to be able to leave after a considerable amount of time. Now, when I left, the group of friends I left with, I was very vocal about my problems with what was going on there. And I was also, I was very angry about it. And I was trying to see if there were other friends I could get together with that might be able to go back there with me. And I, I had all these angry thoughts in my mind. I was very furious. I had, I, I, I there are other people that might also be able to attest that if they had an emotional reaction to this, they might have reacted the same way. I planned on getting a bunch of friends together and going back there and seeing what was going on and engaging in what would have ultimately resulted in, in a, a fight. Uh, that was my first response. Um, when that wasn't permitted to happen because other people that were in my group of friends were in contact with these people, I started confronting my own friends as to being like, why are you talking to these type of people? Why are you um, still okay with what's going on there? And then I would get the cold shoulder. That's when I started losing friends. And then there were no less than two other occasions of which I was brought back into the same type situation.
And, and okay, and how did okay? So I have a few questions. W- after that first time, did you go to the cops about it? And if not, why why not? Shortly after. You did. Okay. Yes. And, and that would be that would be the very first report I ever made. That would okay. be the very start of this before anything ever happened to me. Okay. And the way that I went to the cops was I knew a friend who knew a cop, and I asked him what I should do. And he said I should put a report on the record so that if anything happened to me, the report would be there. He said nothing would happen with it. He said that no cop is ever going to care about what you're saying. But if you put it on the record, at least if something happens, you'll have a report. I already had a strong distrust of authority at this point, but I did know a friend who knew a police officer. And I put the report on the record. And it should be in the exact same um, the exact same like uh, chronological order is the rest of my reports because they all pertain back to it. And every time I made a report since then, I would always reference that because I suspected that I would face retaliation. Uh, and then uh, now knowing what you knew after going to that party at Trace Shannon's house and after making a report and uh, assume not wanting to be around those people anymore, how did you end up two more times in similar situations and what were those situations different people in the group of friends almost as if in a taunting manner would bring me back to places where this was happening and one of which i believe to be the other owners um and one of which i believe to be frank the owner of dante's and uh star which is inadvertently being told to you is not his but it is which is now called paris theater and sassy's and all the other things that guy Um, that's how I know that he is in very close relationship with these other people. So when I see this guy at a party, let's say, let's just say Trace Shannon specifically, when I see him at a party, I'm kind of a hothead and I'm wondering why I'm being brought to the same place as him. And I'm confrontational, um, because I don't want to be there. I don't want to be around this. That's There's already been several of my group of friends that were dropping off at this point that I was not remaining friends with anymore. And uh, the the other time was at an art show. The other time I was brought back was an art show, which all those people were at an art show. And this was a social gathering that was out in public that could have been, I could have stumbled into it, but I wasn't. I was brought there by people that were supposed to be my friends. But when you, when you roll with a whole group of friends and you don't know uh, who is, I, there, there are other people that are going to understand what I'm saying when you say that, like, if you're a musician and you're going to, like, this bar with 10 of these people and you've only got two close friends with you and it turns out that those friends weren't as close as I would have liked and that um, you're going to the next place. Like, it was never like my night started out, oh, here's where we're going and why didn't I ask about this? It was more like, oh, we're at this bar, then we're at this bar, now we're going to a party. And then when we get to the party, we'd find out, like, I would find out that this is... This is that, let's say, that first party. And then the second time I was brought into a party, um, which I think was the other, which <clears throat> I've given you the details about, uh, we don't want to use last names, but um, was brought to the other owner's house. And then when I was brought to the Frank guy's house, those were all where it was like, oh, we, we went to two bars already that night, and now we're going to a house party type scenario. Any Anybody who's... Um, been in a social circle like me will understand what I mean when I say that it's like the third stop on a on a Friday night type situation. Right. And and maybe we should address this, even though we did in the last show. We were talking about going from bar to bar to bar. People are thinking you've been drinking. Do, do, you, do you drink at those bars or what was your state of mind by the time you got to the party? I, I've done no heavy drinking since my son was born. Any of these nights that I go out, I'm having a beer here, a beer there maybe. Um, but in no, at no point in any of this was I ever blackout drunk. I don't have a problem with alcohol. I, I'm never wasted. Uh, that Those days are far behind me. And even those days, if there were those days, were very few and far between and very brief. Uh, uh, so, no, there's no, um, like, blacking out. But anybody who hangs out in Portland knows that you... you uh, you go to one bar, you go to the other, and, and uh, you know, if you go to a house party, you're hoping you can go to a house party if you're going to be out because the bars are really, really crappy here. And I didn't even like going to them when I did. It was just that I was so alienated by being just Mr. Mom that, like, any time I would have a social gathering, I would want to just, like, make the most of my Friday or Saturday night. It wasn't like I was 
doing the touring musician thing like I used to. It was like, oh, my Friday or my Saturday night, that's going to be the only night I get out for this week. And I'm trying to make friends. I'm trying to like find new people in Portland. Uh, and all these people are very new to me. These aren't like these aren't friends that I had for 10 years that all of a sudden betrayed me. These are all friends that I had within a year that all turned out to be a part of this same group of people. And now let's talk about the two other parties. So you ended up at it's Kenneth Pogson, uh, uh, Cat Daddy he goes by. Uh, so you ended up at his house, and then there's a new person being introduced to the story for a lot of people, and that's uh, Frank Fayacci, who is the owner of um, Dante's, and then a number of other club, uh, strip clubs and performance venues. And, and people will be interested to know that I, I, um, I'll be up front in saying that I did speak to Nathan before this call and found out about his coverage of what he's been talking about the last couple days. I've been really busy trying to reestablish any, trying to scrape up the remnants of a, of a life that I can try to scrape up here. But at the, at, at the art, at the, the art gallery party, and at, at Trey's party, I can put Macaulay Culkin at those parties. He's almost the only celebrity that I had any awareness of. I can't attest to any kind of criminal awareness, but I can say that he does know these people. And um, Nathan alluded to the fact that he had been covering this, and I was, uh, was kind of surprised by it because the thing that I'd been telling him is I wanted to speak to him about uh, Frank and, and Dante's and something that we should get into is um, my my speculation about these tunnels because the very first time I was brought into any of these clubs that this Frank guy owns, it, there's this the, there's this bar called the Shanghai Shanghai I think it's called Shanghai Tunnels Bar or Shanghai Bar or something like that, but it's supposed to be the entrance to these tunnels. And when we were doing load in, when my friend's band was playing at a club that this Frank guy owns, which is the first time I was introduced to him, we did load in through these tunnels. We loaded in the band's gear and all the people on the guest list would come in through this back area. And there's several entrances to these tunnels. And I can attest to the fact that I have personally seen that all these clubs are connected to it, including Voodoo Donuts. I have been in these tunnels. I know that they connect these establishments and, and a, a very peculiar amount of them are owned by um, this Frank guy who is very good friends with all the people that I'm mentioning. And he was at all the locations that I'm mentioning. You know, uh, so that person is the owner of Dante's bar. And yeah, I've been talking about Dante's and uh, Macaulay Culkin just randomly. And we had never discussed that at all. And I just mentioned to you that I'd been talking about Dante's and Macaulay. And then you, then I found out that you saw him around and um, that was a really interesting connection. And that's where this guy, Frank comes in who we didn't talk about last time. Um, but we did have but a caller. But he was someone that I mentioned to you the very first time we ever spoke because right. he's a big player in this and what I can only understand is this organization. If I had to say that there was someone who's even more of an organizational pivotal figure in this, besides the owners of Voodoo Donuts, I would have to say that from my impression, it would be him. He owns several properties that are on this alignment of tunnels. And it has been said to me specifically, verbally, specifically by people that I do know have told me specifically that they are pedophiles, that this is the way that they traffic children, which includes Scott Cumming, or I'm, I'm not supposed to use last names, and it includes Julie, Scott, Colleen. Um, these are all people that specifically told me that they, uh, that this is how these tunnels are used and like stuff like drugs. And I know for a fact that there were some people that were with in periphery of the party I was with that received uh, getting cocaine and stuff through someone who met them through the tunnels. So I know that these tunnels are used for illicit criminal activity. And it was said to me that they are used for the child trafficking of which I'm referring. Uh, that's a, a, um, a really explosive claim. And um, l what happened at the art show, just so that we cover all our bases, you, did you see... Well, what did you see at the art show that makes you say Specifically, that was... there were children brought out during one of the exhibits, and they were brought out for a very weird, um, a very weird presentation, and they were brought out in a row as part of like a theatrical 
uh, a theatrical opening part of one of the art, one of one of the art uh, exhibits that were there, and then they were whisked away. And only later did I did I wonder where they went or anything like that. But all when I when all the same figures were at this art show, I was then immediately concerned about why they were there or what the and and when you were talking about art we're talking about all this satanic all this all this shit that they that they that they have with this art it's just like i'm a metalhead okay so i'm not sitting here being like prudish and unable to understand jokes or unable to understand dark imagery i like dark imagery i have i well i mean i guess i used to but i i i have you know, tattoos of, of the, you know, like the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse and stuff like that. Like I, I'm at least before I understood what a lot of it meant, I understand that there can be a lot of people that are involved in dark imagery and not have any nefarious connections. But when you're talking about an art show with people that are, uh, that are making like no qualms about the fact that they are involved in child trafficking and pedophilia and stuff like that. And you see pedophilic art and satanic art and bloodletting type art and graphic images and stuff like that. And you see children involved with it. It's automatically alarming. It should alarm anybody. I want people to start opening their eyes to the fact that there should not like just as my instinct as a father, there should not be kids involved in sexually explicit art or violent art. Like where did the parental, like, um, you know, deterrent to that, like, start? I didn't want my kid to see me play Call of Duty or anything like that when he was born. I was like, this is too much for a kid. So when these people are trying to brush away the fact that they're involving children in, in, in sexually explicit and violent art, I want you to just look into your conscience and say, like, just like when we're talking about all these things that are going on now in the public and saying, are these jokes? Are they really jokes? Well, when you're involving actual kids, there's no excuse. There's no excuse. Uh, well, that's uh, I agree with you. Um, although I should say these are your allegations. Okay, I've, mine I, alone. I, I'm giving you a yes. platform to say you know we talked beforehand about you know not wanting to get into any, too much yeah, information. Yeah, I'll go out right now and let me just reiterate: any claims I'm making are mine and mine alone. Any allegations that I'm making are mine and mine alone. Any names that I'm naming are uh, specifically allegations that I'm making. No one has uh, bribed or coaxed me into making these. Nathan is in no way supporting my claims. He's just giving me a platform of which to express my story. And um, all the claims I'm making, I'm more than happy to uh, to face people uh, wanting to dispel these claims in a court of law because it at that point, I think that a lot of interesting things would come up. So just going through everything step by step, and then we'll go back to Dante's, the third party, Kenneth Poxon. What was what happened at that party that was similar to other things you'd seen? When you not? say third, which one do you mean? I, our at Ken, at, uh, well, I don't know which order they happened in either, but I was talking about the story with the other owner of Voodoo Donuts. Cat Daddy? Yeah. Okay. Pogson. Pogson. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, when I was brought to his, when I was brought to his house, it was almost the same situation, except it was a lot nicer. It, like if, if you, if, if you go to, um, Trey Shannon's house, he's got a lot of like wacky shit on the walls and a lot of, um, you know, like, uh, weird art and things of that nature. But, uh, this was a little different. This was like a little, a little bit of a nicer house. And then I was being told by people, I got really frustrated and angry with my friends because I was told that I was at the owner of Voodoo Donuts house. And I was like, no, I've been there. I've been there before. This isn't that house. And I had no idea that there were two owners. Um, and uh, then it was explained to me. No, they were like, "No, you are. This, this this is one of the owners of Voodoo Donuts." And um, and it basically, long story short, it, it was revealed to me that I was at the second owner of Voodoo Donuts' house, and it was the 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 same situation. You can paint it in almost the exact same light. And I was confronted again by me wanting to leave. Any time I went to these parties, like I, this is a question I have for anybody else, like you know, or. I, anybody who's at these these parties and they say that they were there i'm wondering why the hell they didn't leave why didn't they say something well this, this is what happens when you do you get confronted by a group of people who are asking why you want to leave 
why you have a problem with what's happening, why you're asking questions. Why do you want to know whose parents of these kids are? Why do you, what, who are you to ask and all these things and being intimidated. And um, I can't say that it was engineered or it was just good luck that I was able to leave these parties. But based on what's happened to me since then, I would have to say that um, I was allowed to leave because they thought that I was under control. I mean, I don't know. I guess that they thought I'd be scared enough by the situation. But I've also attended events that were of, uh, we're saying Frank, um, uh, events at his establishments as well. I've also been to innocuous uh, events at his establishments that I found out later. Like I've been to Dante's and, you know, there's been nothing there. And I know like there's been several girls who work at clubs of his and have done modeling things for him that I ended up being friends with that were also part of telling me exactly what happens with, with this person and these people. And they're also some of the people that came forward to help me have an understanding of what goes on there. And there are several girls who worked for him as dancers who I was friends with, who also told me about criminal activity and about child trafficking. Um, so, you know, I've also been to, to several of this Frank guys establishments where nothing happened, but, uh, I, I, the, the importance of that is to illustrate how good of friends he is with the, the same people that I'm implicating and his, uh, participation at the same parties that I'm that I'm verifying that I saw eyewitness um, criminal activity that I believe was involved in the sexual abuse of minors and the, and the trafficking of children, my own eyewitness accounts, not just what is being told to me. So I can verify that that he is friends with these people and was at these locations. And uh, you also said after what you've seen, you had people approach you that told you that uh, it was going on and told you they were a part of it? Is that, is that? Yes, I, I was approached by Scott, Colleen, Julie, um, <clears throat> in what was, uh, what seemed to be an intimidation move to tell me that this is what they do. Um, at first I was, I was speculative of the, the motive of why I would be being told these things, why they would tell me straight up that this is what they do. But as far as I can gather, can I interrupt when you say this is what they do? What did they say to you exactly? I mean, people want to know as close to, they said that they are pedophiles and they're involved in child trafficking. Okay. And they you... said that my accusations against them were accurate. These are people that are confronting me, telling me things that I've said to my own friends and confidence and verifying my claims. But the way that they're doing it is they're sitting me down saying, yeah, this is what happens. What's your problem with it? What do you think is going to happen about it? And as if there, nothing could possibly ever happen to them. And this is directly, directly before all of the turmoil in my life started catastrophically destroying everything. This is the last interaction that I had before I start being followed on the street and and getting threats and my house being broken into on several different occasions, all of which are reported, all of these things. These, these are the interactions that led to that, which is why it's not hard for me to understand that this is all uh, the same effort. Um, and because you're talking about people that told you, one of those people that told you that they were actually involved in in the illicit behavior was connected to comet pizza is that right yeah it's my understanding that that it, i i mean people can be able to verify this uh i mean hopefully but it's my understanding that scott colleen and julie were all people who worked in washington dc for for comet and it's like they are the reasons why I was able to look into Pizzagate, why I knew it was a thing to look into, because they were saying that as if a way to say, like, we didn't get caught then. What makes you think that, like, you matter now? And I didn't know what Comet Ping Pong was. I didn't know what all, all this all this stuff was until I looked into it after. And that would be the exact time that I started messaging people like the people that are coming forward saying, hey, what was your message nine months ago about? That was exactly then. And trying to figure out what that meant. Why would I care that they worked there? Why would I? Why would I 
give a crap that they worked in Washington, D.C., and that's what was told to me. And then, obviously, I was able to quickly ascertain why that would be a threat. And they were threatening me with saying that they were a part of this, and look what happened. Wow, that, that's a really interesting story for a lot of people. Um, and one of those people was involved in, is, what was the business they were involved in? Uh, they have a business here in Portland, Oregon, where they're, I, I'm almost positive that their entire business is making child coffins, but it could be just coffins in general. Now, I wasn't aware that Voodoo ships out donuts and coffins. That's something I've been made aware of since. And when, you, when if anybody wants to look into the coffin company of which I'm referring and find out that if they have a business relationship with Voodoo, I'd be very interested to know the results of that. All I know is that I was directly like blown away by the fact that they make child coffins. Like knowing that anybody makes child coffins would kind of be a weird thing. And I'd be like, wow, that's a morbid profession. But the fact that they do that and they're telling me that they're involved in this type of thing, I've seen them involved in this type of thing, I know that they're involved in this type of thing, and that is their profession, then it becomes a little bit, obviously, as a, as a, as a threat type situation where you're like, oh, holy shit, like, okay. And, you know, I don't know how other people feel about this, but I'm out here on a limb. I'm out here trying to... To, to expose this and maybe I'm naive and stupid for thinking that I ever could. I don't want to believe that. But when they sit there and they tell you that they, when they tell you how they haven't gotten caught and how nothing could ever happen to them as a threat and you know that that's the truth, that nothing has happened to them and you don't know if anything is going to happen to them. I hope and I believe and I have faith that that's not true, but in looking into it, we can all see why they would use it as a, as a point of pride because nothing's happened thus far. And how do you connect those people to Voodoo Donuts? Uh, or do they connect directly to Voodoo Donuts or are they just part of the same circle of friends or do they connect with Frank's clubs or? Well, I'd be interested to find out if they have a business relationship with Voodoo or not, but the only way that I met them is through the people at Voodoo Donuts, through through the girl that I know that worked there, the, the girl that I know that worked at Voodoo. That was one of the reasons why we came to this party, who was friends with my friend Robert, and um, through being at a party at the owner of Voodoo Donuts' house. And they were all there at the same time. That's the only reason I know them at all. That's the only reason they knew to talk to me is because they were there at that time. Did they confront you all at once? Did they invite you over to, I mean, how? No, did... they, confronted, they confronted me when I was out with other friends and it seemed like it was kind of an engineered meetup, but they confronted me, all of them at the same time at a, a outside location when I was with other friends. Okay. All right. I think I, we have the story for how you were told. You were also told by people who didn't have first, who weren't ab abusers themselves, right? Allegedly, but who also knew about it going on. And w who were those people or how did you? So those that are happen? a couple of my friends that I don't think are involved, that I've, I've still lost them as friends since because they're too scared to be friends with me anymore. Or, um, there's a couple of my friends that I don't think would ever be involved in this. I can hope and pray that they're not the friends that were part of the introductory status. And there's several girls I know through working at venues and doing sound for a, a another owner who owns several clubs in Portland is the job that I just got fired from, which was doing sound for him, a direct competitor of which I know that he does know Frank. Okay, so... I worked for a person who owns several venues, and I was his I was his executive sound engineer. And um, I know several girls that work at clubs that are owned by Frank that have come to me and told me that this is happening. And I know several friends through this group that have told me that this is happening. Several people that have come to me and told me that they do know Colleen, they do know Julie, they do know Scott, they do know these other people, they do know Trace, and like. You know, they've come to me and told me that about this going on and they're too afraid to speak out. They're too afraid to say anything. They've been threatened. One person specifically told me that they'd been paid off. And, you know, so I've had people confirm this. All I was doing was trying to get confirmation of this in the very, very weeks and months after I was confronted with it. Okay, so let's get to um, let's get to 
the clubs. Well, let's talk about Dante's because I've been talking about Dante's and I found this strange connection with Macaulay Culkin, who strangely for the way this whole story has developed um, is best friends with Seth Green. And, and I didn't know that either. Yeah, it's it's really an interesting story. And uh, I've been looking into him and he uses a lot of satanic imagery uh, uh you know we've gone through it on this channel people can take a look and uh, overtly satanic and so let's talk about dante's you've played that club before yeah and you were you said the first time you were there you they took you to the tunnels no it was it was the second time i was there i was brought in through it wasn't my band that was playing it was my friend's band that was playing and we were brought in through the tunnels in the back way because they were friends with them. It was like special that we were brought, being brought in through the back that we were able to use the tunnels. It was because I know I knew someone who was someone. It wasn't something that like all the bands get to do. It, it, it was my impression that it was only people who know somebody that get to use them and stuff like that. And we were able to load in through the back and the tunnels connect in two separate places to the back of two different clubs. Because after the show, we were able to use the tunnels to go from one club to another one that was owned by the same person. I didn't know that because he was covering the drinks. So all the friends that I was with were getting covered by the same owner and he was having us go to another club that was his. And the Shanghai bar is supposed to be like the entrance or, or it like says it's the entrance. I couldn't tell you what's the main entrance. I don't know. I just know that they're all connected. Okay. And how does Macaulay Culkin fit into this whole story? Well, I only know because he was at the art show and he, and he was at a music show at Dante's. I, I have had two conversations with him. I've been around him. Um, I was surprised by the fact that he was there. I thought it was super cool to meet him. I only knew that it was important uh, because of the fact that it's been brought up now. Like, and, and I had no idea of who his friends are and the fact that he's best friends with someone that let's say Isaac is implicated in, in the same type of thing. Am I surprised? No. Um, but obviously when I was thinking about this type of thing, there are a couple other people I met of notable names that I'm going to leave out of it. But the fact that he's been implicated in this situation, I would like to offer um, a a uh, extension of goodwill to to Macaulay Culkin. I I uh, if if you see this, uh, Macaulay, um, I'm I hope you remember meeting me. If not, that's okay. But you seem to be friends with a lot of the people that I'm implicating, and a lot of people that other people have implicated, and you seem to be wanting to do interviews. So why don't you come forward and put it to rest? Why don't you? come forward and try to explain some of these connections. Why don't you come forward and address these claims? Why don't you come forward and explain why you seem to be friends with a bunch of pedophiles and why you seem to be friends with a bunch of people that are involved in criminal activity? I'd be more than happy to talk to you. I think that you would remember meeting me. If you don't, that's fine. But if you do remember meeting me, I'd love to talk to you because you know that I'm a person that was around and a person that was involved in certain circles of friends that you're also involved in. So to talk to me as a peer. And if you can't do that, then just come forward and address the claims and, and um, step on my, uh, my accusations if you can, because I'd be very interested to know why you have such connections with all these people yet, um, aren't involved in anything illicit. Uh, It'd be very interesting for me to hear the explanation of that. Yeah. I think everybody would be interested in hearing somebody ask um, Macaulay some of the real questions that people have. Um, Let me just ask you, I think, I think we covered quite a bit today and got into some of the detail that we missed on the last one. Why are you doing this? You know, you're naming people's names, you're putting yourself at risk. You've, you you know you you save experience you know all of this uh, negative all these negative consequences because of you know even objecting to what was going on and you haven't seen any results the police are still saying there's no credible evidence uh, they're still smearing you and and me in the media trying to say why all kinds of reasons not to believe this story why. Why are you doing it? Why are we still talking? Well, I don't know if I'm in a, in a, um, I don't think there's anything special about me, to be honest. Um, I just think that maybe the fact that, uh, I, um, went through this as a kid puts me in a unique position to 
not uh, be able to sit idly by and let this happen to one other kid on my watch. If there's anything I can do, it, like, you know, if, if I can stop this from happening to one kid like it happened to me, then I will consider this a full and complete success, even if it means that I, I'm no longer around, okay? Because I went through this as a kid. We went through that last time, okay? I don't know if that puts me in a unique position to have a moral... Of, I can't understand why any human being wouldn't morally object to what's going on. I don't understand how there are rings of these people. I would think that anyone with this predilection would be hiding in the shadows with their shame, but apparently not. Apparently there are groups of people that think this is okay. And I don't care how acceptable it becomes in... in modern society in in modern parlance i'm never going to be okay with it i'm never going to sit idly by and let it happen around me and what happened to me as a kid is is abhorrent and if i can stop it from happening to one other kid then i will consider everything that i've done a success because the 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 torture that i went through i don't want it to ever happen to anybody else any other kid children are are innocence their purity they are they are a blank slate and to destroy something like that as far as i'm concerned is the worst possible thing you could do on this earth worse than any other act and knowing that it does happen and knowing that it happened to me makes me not be able to just sit by and let it happen to anybody else you know one thing that'll make a big difference i already said this is if somebody else you know it sounds like there are a lot of people that know what's going on so, there are. Yeah. Are you reaching out to those people? I have reached out to several, and and uh, I'm trying to see if anybody else. You know, I can't. Uh, I can't. I can't do as much as I I would like to. And I know that there are so many supporters out there that are willing to help. I mean, they 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 helped me get out of the place I was in, and now I'm faced with a lot of a, a lot of problems that I have to deal with now. But I know that there are people out there that can make a movement out of this thing and that's the idea is to create a create a situation where these people feel like they can come out and if i'm out here and i can't find uh, a leg to stand on and i can't find a life to rebuild nobody else is going to want to come forward and put themselves through what i'm going through so i want to try to be an example to show people that like you can still live and do this. You will have a support group of people that are going to help you. You will have uh, uh, the ability to still to still have a life and come forward because we need to show people that this can be done. We need to show people that you can come forward because if we create the, the type of environment where they believe that they can do it, then they will come forward. And I don't, you know, I had to try and step up and be that example of somebody who can do it because then they will. If, they, if, if people believe that there's enough support for them out there, they'll come forward. And what is, what's on the road for you next? I mean, where, where do things go f from here for you? For me? Yeah, as much as you can say safely. I uh, mean, I'm, um, you know, people were able to help me get out of where I was, and it was only because of the generosity of your listeners and the people that this story have touched that I was able to do that. Now I have to try and find some kind of uh, stable place to be. Um, I have to try and find an ability to build a foundation and to try and get back on my feet and to to try and move forward in some way, shape, or form. Um, to try and and remain viable and 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 remain alive and remain able to keep telling my story and remain able to do part three with you and remain able to to just exist so that's where i'm at right now only because of the grace of god and your listeners and the people that the story have touched was i able to get out of the situation i was in i was able to do that and i am immensely grateful i have so much gratitude for that and now i have to try and uh do step two and um your son is real important in this whole story and are you going to be able to see him in the meantime, while you're getting back on your feet? I, I, I do believe so. And if I'm able to prove that I can have um, like things like housing and, and support for him, then they can't stop me from seeing him, which is what's really important as well. If I'm able to prove that I have permanent housing and permanent uh, way to provide for him, they can't stop me from seeing him, which is also very important. And I don't want to go into anything else ab about, uh, about him, but just... 
I, I, uh, I think that I'll be able to, to, to see it. Okay. All right. Well, that's, you know, it's important to everybody. Um, you know, I'll tell you, I'll tell my audience how they can support you. And, um, you know, regardless of anything, I know you were by the grace of God able to get out of the situation you're in and into a situation where, you know, how do you feel? You feel, you feel safe. I mean, after this, you're going to be able to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm, I think I'm safe. It's just tough. It's just tough, but yeah, I'm safe now. And that's thanks to, to everybody. Um, that's thanks to everybody. So that's huge. You know, it's huge, but it's just tough. Yeah, I know. Well, we're going to be talking more as much as, as much as that scares people out there and invites, um, threats and other things. I know you're committed to getting to the end of this, this story, huh? Yeah. And I'm going to keep talking and I'm going to keep setting the example that other people can do it too. And it might be hard, but it's worth it. You know, it's worth it. You, you feel like you're, you feel like you're getting the rewards from it. Even be, it's re- worth it just in and of itself to be telling the story. Well, I mean, look at the people that are reaching out. Like maybe not everybody can help support me, but um, the people that are reaching out, they feel just as passionately as I do about this. And they, we all need some kind of justice and we all want to see justice done and we all want to see this stop. So it starts with every single one of you. It starts with every single one of you. Like it started with me. I found myself in a unique position and I'm not going to cower from it. Um, but every single person out there who offers their support, who, uh, feels passionately it's, it's, that is what matters. It's every single one of us finding it within ourselves to step forward and do what we can. That's going to make the difference. And that's what I want people that could speak out to know as well. So every single one of the people that has reached out to me with words of support, you're just like me and I'm doing this for you as much as I'm doing it for the kids and to stop this from happening. So it is worth it. It's hard to, it's hard to say that I'm reaping the rewards of it, but I'm faithful that, um, that is what's coming. No, oh, me too. Thanks, thanks for joining me. I know you're tired uh, from from you know what's been going on this last week, but we wanted to. I wanted to give you a chance to tell more of the story, um, especially with what the media is saying and and what critics are saying at this point. I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go, and uh, and and we'll be back t- to tell more of the story now in a little faster succession, so we can. Yeah, finish. Yeah, and we're we're kind of we're kind of staying on the on the beat of what's happening, um, and trying to uh, tell the story in in a way that is uh, congruent with the events as they unfold. But um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot more to go into. Okay, well, I'll I'll be here to host you as long as I can, you know, as long as I have a channel with people watching. Um, I'll be here to to talk as long as I can. All right, all right, man. Have a good night. All right, brother. Thank you so much. Thanks. And thank you to everyone who's helping out. It it means the world to me. And, um, yeah, thank you so much to everybody. Um, Thank you, Nathan. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Michael. All right. See ya. Okay, you can find Michael uh, on Twitter at VeganMikey, V-E-G-A-N-M-I-K-E-Y. You can find him on Twitter. You can direct message him there. Um, he's gotten a lot of offers for support. Um, we want to be able to help people, uh, who are coming forward and help people feel like they're going to be supported. And I think that's, uh, maybe why Michael reached out to me and, uh, I hope to be able to offer a platform for people, you know, who after doing our due diligence, um, have a story to tell that, that deserves to be aired and, you know, you see, Michael, he's, he's okay. He's okay. And, and we're using a a lot of faith. You know, I'm not nearly in the kind of danger, um, that Michael is facing, but you never know. It's a pretty serious story. It's pretty serious allegations. And it seems to me, it seems to me like the, the police are taking it seriously. It seems, seems like, um, based on, you know, my dealings with them so far. So in any case, 
Um, if you want to support um, Michael, his PayPal is uh, in the description for this. It's paypal.me slash vegan Mikey. And, um, and that's all we have to say for this show. So thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks everybody who's taking this seriously. Um, you can find me. I'm going to go over to Twitch. I'm going to take some phone calls um, over at Twitch, which is uh, twitch.tv slash lift the veil 411. So we can leave this interview up in a length that people can watch after the fact. Twitch.tv slash lift the veil 411 or download the app and search for lift the veil and you'll. Uh, you can follow me there, hit your notifications, and you'll see me when I go live. Uh, you can find this on podcast by searching Lift the Veil. You can catch up on the story Michael told on Saturday. I'd recommend that. And then the coverage leading up to this, a lot of which involved Dante's and um, Macaulay Culkin. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to go over to Twitch right now for YouTube. That is what it is. <laughs>